Hi everyone and welcome to the second night of our Fashion Interpretation Symposium. We are so excited for you to be here with us, whether it's your first session or you are booked in to spend the entire week with us. My name is Fran and I am the Fashion Interpretations Networking Project Administrator. So for those of you who might need some quick background information on the project, Fashion Interpretations is an AHRC funded research project led by Dr. Rebecca Arnold from the Courtauld and Professor Judith Clark from the London College of Fashion. And we are an international interdisciplinary network focused on the ways modern and contemporary fashion is continually reinterpreted through varied mediums. We are seeking to gain insight into the ways representational modes translate and reconfigure the meaning of fashion itself. So tonight we have three speakers from the project. Starting this session, we have Lisa Cohen, who is the Associate Professor of English and Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies at Wesleyan University in Connecticut in the US. Then we have Olga Weinstein joining us from Russia, who is a senior researcher at the Russian State University for the Humanities in Moscow. And then finally, we have Elizabeth Katesko, who is the pathway leader for the MA in Fashion Critical Studies at Central St. Martins in London, who is closing our presentations this evening. We will then be handing over to our assistant, Olivia Smales, who will be holding our Q&A session later. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask our speakers regarding their papers, please pop them in the chat box. <coughs> very hard to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A, which will be held after everyone has presented. So with that, I would like to pass you on to Lisa Cohen. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Fran. Let me just start the screen share. I uh, just wanted to thank you again, Fran, and huge thanks to Rebecca and Judith for dreaming up this curation and, and really concatenation of approaches to thinking about clothes and for welcoming, and, uh, welcoming me into the conversation. And of course, to Jane and to, to Dahl and to all of the participants for their collaborations. My project is a series of reports on encounters with people around the idea and the actualities of clothing and grief. These are experiments in portraiture. They take the form of short essays about how various sartorial remnants hold the bodies of the dead and our memories of them. Um, and there are accompanying photographs. My medium is mostly words, sentences, and in this case, um, some images, and also importantly, the voices and memories of those I've interviewed. The work grows out of a book I'm completing uh, that's about queer friendship, notions of preservation and decay and enlightenment legacies in the context of the long history of HIV AIDS. So um, it's also worth noting that today is World AIDS Day, the day without art. And I'm going to read uh, slightly abbreviated versions of two of these pieces. The first one is called her parents' clothes. And it opens like all of them do with a quotation. I think you can be at a point with these clothes where they mean something to you. And then one day you look at them and think, this is just an old shamata. I need to get rid of it. It's like a lemon that has had the juice all wrung out. You're done with it. She was showing me a black bolero cardigan she had found in her mother's closet when her mother was still alive, which she had worn for decades, beginning in her 20s, sometimes over a dress, sometimes with black jeans, most pleasurably with a pair of high-waisted gold linen slacks, edged at its borders with black sequins, decorated also with black sequin flowers and black velvet ribbon. The cropped three-quarter sleeve sweater was made of orlon, so almost indestructible. She had no memory of her mother wearing it. It had been a gift from her husband. And by the time I was born, I don't think it would have fit her, she said. She was talking about how her mother had saved her husband's slippers after his death because she worried he would come back and wouldn't have any shoes. The desire to clothe the dead, to keep their feet warm so they can walk with us again. When her mother died, she interred these slippers with her ashes, along with a pristine pair that her mother had saved, another gift from her husband. They were red velvet, very impractical. He would buy her these elegant things that were about a version of her that either no longer existed or had never existed, and she would never wear them. She was showing me her mother's wedding dress, a simple ivory linen frock with pale yellow eyelet lace, 
inherited on her mother's death, which she wishes to no longer possess. And she was talking about two other dresses garnered from her mother's closet during her lifetime. One, which had a sheath of pale gray eyelet lace over a dove gray bodice, she had made over to fit herself, adding a pleated dusty rose cummerbund and an underskirt of about seven layers of tulle. It was fantastic, she said. I wore it a lot in the mid eighties. And I remember sitting on the subway one day thinking, I look amazing, not the way I tend to think about myself. The other dress had been impossible to adapt to her body. It was so wide, she told me, and had all these pleats and was probably a size 12 and I wore a size four or two. I was really tiny, but it was very beautiful and kind of sexy with lace half sleeves and a plunging cross bodice, very Marilyn Monroe. It was an afternoon in mid-February, 2020. We were in Anne's apartment in Manhattan. She's an art historian who is superbly attuned to the vitality of ephemeral objects and texts. Still, she spoke again and again about her need to let go of these clothes of the dead. In boxes in my office, she said, I have both of my parents' christening dresses. I have some of my own baby clothes that my mother saved. She saved diapers because it was a huge thing for her to have had a child at her age. It was a miracle. I think I still have the first dress I ever made, she told me, which I can't quite bring myself to get rid of. I made a lot of my clothes when I was that age because I was so small, I couldn't find clothes to fit me. There was one fantastic 70s dress that I pieced together from a crazy fabric, a caftan dress with wide sleeves. I was very proud of it. She was telling me that the slippers accepted when her father died, her mother had been intent on getting rid of most of his clothes quite quickly, which seems to be a pattern, she said. Either people don't ever want to do it or do it right away. Describing that energy of disposal, though, made her remember that she had, in fact, retrieved and worn some of her father's clothes, too. There was a coat with a really fantastic zipper, wide and with a teapot made of aluminum. I'd forgotten about that. And I kept his flannel bathrobe, a black watch plaid which is weird to have forgotten because I wore that more than anything and until very recently. My dad basically lived in this bathrobe after work. She was talking about her mother's feelings about good taste and the clothes fights they had had when Anne was a child. She had upper middle class ideas about clothes but downward aspirational emotions. And she was telling me about the fact that her mother had bought her few clothes, though she could afford them, from a fear of spoiling her only child. As the middle child growing up in a tempestuous environment, she said, my mother's coping mechanism was to be invisible. And I think she wanted me to be invisible too, because she knew it as a safe space. Then once I moved to New York and started learning about fashion and finding places to buy things I liked, she got very uptight and would say things like, don't bring those clothes home. My dad was the opposite. He loved beautiful things. When he was younger, he had his suits made by hand. More than once, Anne said to me, but I feel like these relationships are becoming less and less relevant. And so the things themselves are less charged as I get older. She returned to her mother's wedding dress. I just haven't been able to figure out what to do with it. I just need to get rid of it. And this is called some of his clothes. And you'll see that I am implicated in this situation more directly. <clears throat> he is absolutely, totally part of the fabric of my everyday life. I don't think about him because he's always there. Stephen, a filmmaker, is talking about the film editor, actor, writer, and AIDS activist, Jim Lyons, our mutual friend who died in 2007. The years have passed, Stephen says, where things have happened. And I thought, damn, I wish I could tell Jim about this. Or, fuck, Jim. Those days are done because you can only do that for so long. And then it just becomes the fabric of your every day. He and Jim met around 1994 when Stephen was finishing his first feature film. Jim looked at it, the most uncomfortable screening of my life, and gave crucial feedback. Sometime later, they ran into each other on the street. He was on his way somewhere, all dressed up, and he brought me to the party. And from there, it just grew in an organic way. Jim would invite him to the edit room, 
I got to watch him work, Stephen told me, and not just watch, but think through editing choices together. I was younger, but he treated me like a peer. Or they would see a movie together, walk around New York City, talk for hours, eat a meal, go to another screening. I was lucky to be taken under his wing and then to become actual friends. Jim is also part of the fabric of Stephen's second film, Jason and Shirley, his response to Shirley Clark's portrait of Jason. He was the one who put me on the path by demystifying Clark's film and sympathizing with why I was having such trouble with it, how Clark seemed to be subjecting her star, Jason Holliday, the lone gay black lead figure in all of essential cinema to a series of off-screen overseers. Stephen had been unable to sit through it, but Jim said, no, we'll watch the whole thing. And watching it with him, I was able to relax for the first time. I didn't feel implicated. I could say, okay, so this is this person and he's putting on a show. They spent the rest of the day walking and walking and talking about it. Jim completely understood my marginalization as an African-American queer filmmaker and how ridiculous it was. He was always someone I could talk to about that and he wouldn't need anything explained. We were on the same bearing. After Jim's death, when his partner gave away some of his clothes, Stephen got two garments. He said, one was a t-shirt with Tiananmen Square on it, very volatile. I only wore it a couple of times. And one was a bright blue sweater. I outgrew them both. I gave the sweater to a young artist. It never suited me anyway. It was more just to have, and it looked great on him. It was made for him. That's what you're supposed to do sometimes, pass things on. After Jim's death, I chose several of his t-shirts, which I've kept in the plastic bag in which I took them away on a high shelf in my closet now for over 13 years. Stephen and I talked about Jim first in May, 2018, then again in February, 2020. The second time, because he agreed to try on these t-shirts as part of this project. I asked him again that day about his mother whose death had just preceded Jim's and about her clothes. She wore Norma Kamali, he said, she was fabulous. She was part of the Diana Ross generation. Beautiful black women wearing fabulous clothes is a revolutionary act. You don't need a reason, you are the reason. Always look like you're going somewhere. After caring for her through her death, Stephen said, I came back to New York, an empty shell. When he visited Jim, who was sick with HIV and multiple infections, they had end zone conversations. One day, he said, we were talking about music when he asked suddenly and very bluntly, what do you think it's going to be like? Stephen said to him, it's going to be like a series of painful events that are then followed by relaxing events. Jim cried, Stephen held him, and then he pulled himself back up. At the old loft in Lower Manhattan where we met last February, I ripped open the plastic bag, the t-shirts, there were Joni Mitchell, Iggy Pop, and Jimi Hendrix. There was a blue cotton something commemorating the Cannes Film Festival of 1998, a Calvin Klein tank top, almost new. Stephen had invited Brian, a film editor for whom Jim was also a mentor. The pictures I took of the two of them were of gay men in middle age who have survived. I thought about Stephen telling me that Jim had taught him how to be an older man. He had said, I'm older now than he was when he died. I remember when he was 44 and I was 35 or whatever, and I thought that's how I'm going to be when I'm an older man, suave motherfucker. In the spring of 2002, Jim Lyons gave a talk about one of his obsessions, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. I work as a film editor, he said. The clothes I'm wearing tonight are the clothes I wear when I have to have meetings with my agent or some producer. I think I look good in them but they always make me a little sad. I feel when I put them on that I'm trying to look good. Talking about his clothes that night was one of the ways Jim dramatized that film's intense self-referentiality, its focus on the performances required to make it in Hollywood. Talking about his clothes now is one of my ways of holding and making something of the evidence of his life, which also includes his journals and unproduced film scripts. My generation, Stephen said, we're the orphans. And everybody who was nine, 10, 12 years older than us is either dead or an asshole because all of their friends are dead. He said, Jim was my role model. And so I am proud. 
It's true that Jim was all about passing things on, as Stephen put it. He was one of the most generous souls I've ever known. His t-shirts have made me too sad to wear. Instead, I'm writing a book about him and his work, but I'm starting to think I should pass on the tank top that looked so good on Brian. Give Stephen the con t-shirt. Finally, start wearing one myself. Thank you. And now I will pass the microphone to Olga Feinstein. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'm beginning to share the screen. Okay, is it okay now? Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of our project and uh, the conference. And uh, today, I will be giving a small talk entitled uh, The Latest Thing for Boys, uh, Little Lord Fauntleroy and Children's Fashion. So my research in the frame of uh, fashion interpretations uh, focuses on the impact of Little Lord uh, Fauntleroy suit described in the 1886 eponymous uh, novel by uh, Francis Hudson Burnett. The book was uh, illustrated by Reginald Birch and uh, his drawings had a decisive influence on the late 19th and early 20th century children's fashion. I'm trying to examine the interaction of literature and fashion through book illustration, aiming to investigate how the medium influences the message, how a subtle web of cultural illusions works through different mediums. As a starting point, I was interested to think uh, how fashion and fiction interact. What are the cultural contexts of their mut mutual interpretations? Obviously, literature and fashion may influence each other through a whole range of communication tools and uh, mediums ranging from the spoken word, film adaptations of books and fashion magazines to painting or even critical literature. So in my case, uh, the connection between literature and fashion was established through uh, book uh, illustration. Readers would uh, pore over the illustrations by the artist uh, Reginald Birch and very quickly uh, the novel Little Lord Fauntleroy as portrayed by Burnett proved immensely popular and uh, uh, the suit uh, depicted in the novel produced a significant direct impact on kids uh, and boys' fashion. So in, uh, in spite of uh, its uh, overwhelming popularity, uh, the Fauntleroy suit, here you see it, uh, is ironically described in the novel only a handful of times. The writer mentions the best summer suit of cream colored flannel with the red scarf around his waist or such details as red stockings or Van Dyke collar. And a full description is given only once. Uh, what uh, the Earl saw was a graceful childish figure in a black velvet suit with a lace collar and with love locks waving about the handsome, manly little face whose eyes met his with a look of innocent good fellowship. Nowhere in the novel does Burnett imply that the outfit was in any way unusual for a young boy of Cedric's age. But as if to compensate this lack of uh, details, Reginald Birch's pictures showed uh, Cedric's dress in full. The illustrations were carefully scrutinized by the readers with doting mothers proceeding to put together outfits for their sons in the style of Little Lord Fauntleroy. These consisted of black or navy blue velvet jacket, white blouse with large lace collar 
and velvet knee pants with stockings or long socks. And uh, the velvet suit was more popular in winter with twill or flannel more commonly used in warmer weather. The breeches were usually worn uh, with a bright silk belt, large velvet berry, and patent leather shoes with buckles for full effect. And many boys also wore love knots, uh, just exactly as in the picture and as described in the novel. So why were the parents inspired to dress their sons following these illustrations? Well, first of all, uh, because Birch's elaborate detailed pen and ink drawings were indeed very stylish and very influential. He was really a well-known book illustrator and um, contemporary fashion magazines abounded in countless pictures based on the illustrations by Birch. These pictures were the next step in fashion interpretation process. The descriptions in the magazines provided all the necessary technical details. Uh, while the pictures were featuring both the entire outfit and its uh, individual elements. Mothers would make or um, uh, use these uh, pictures to uh, buy ready-made uh, suits from catalogs. This is an example of such a catalog page. And uh, the favorite uh, perhaps was the uh, Fontleroy blouse with its uh, lace co collars and cuffs, which would often be decorated with uh, embroidery. And see if you, here you see some examples. These are the blouses uh, in uh, uh, Fontleroy style. Uh, and um, uh, to return to Birch's drawings, actually, uh, they were based on the uh, uh, photographs uh, of uh, Burnett's son, uh, Vivian, and uh, his um, eye-catching outfit was designed uh, by uh, his mother. Uh, Burnett gave uh, one of the pictures of uh, Vivian uh, to uh, Birch, and um, so uh, here you see the photo, uh, which uh, was used for creating the illustrations. You see that uh, even uh, the uh, pose and the gestures uh, are the same. Uh, Vivian uh, here stands like uh, in the illustration, uh, putting his uh, uh, hands uh, in his hips. And um, uh, Vivian's suit was uh, clearly is inspired uh, by late uh, 17th, early 18th century uh, court uh, dress. And uh, there were, however, uh, contemporary versions uh, of such suits, uh, which uh, clearly also fed the writer's uh, sartorial imagination. And uh, one of the most uh, striking and uh, evident uh, examples uh, of such uh, uh, suit is uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, aesthetic uh, costume, uh, which he used during his American tour in 1882. Uh, and uh, if we remember that uh, Little Lord Fauntleroy was published four years later, uh, then uh, we shall see that uh, while well, these outfits uh, were uh, resembling uh, each other. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Oscar Wilde uh, was also inspired in his turn uh, by uh, Thomas Gainsborough, uh, his famous um, uh, portrait of uh, Jonathan Bartle, uh, the blue boy. And uh, besides being inspired by Gainsborough, that's uh, another link uh, in our chain, uh, Oscar Wilde's lecturing outfit was also uh, linked uh, with the 1881 uh, staging uh, in London of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Patience, uh, the comic opera. 
and uh, the aesthetic suit uh, of one of the characters uh, was uh, pretty, pretty much like uh, the one used by Wilde for his lecturing tour. Uh, but uh, um, uh, Francis Burnett, however, never made any allusion to Oscar Wilde's uh, uh, dress. Uh, but she freely admitted that uh, Reginald Birch's illustrations for her book were based on the clothes worn by her son Vivian. And uh, uh, in uh, 1894, uh, by then a well-established author, uh, Burnett produced the story how Fauntleroy occurred and a, little, a real little boy became an ideal one. Uh, uh, which uh, traced the origin of her popular book. Uh, this essay, interestingly, was also illustrated by Reginald Birch. And furthermore, when depicting the real uh, Vivian, uh, Birch drew him in the very same uh, Fauntleroy suit that Cedric wears in, the, uh, in his early illustrations. And uh, uh, among these images, this one, I think is very interesting here. Um, the writer, uh, Burnett, is reading uh, her manuscript uh, to her son. And the caption for this drawing reads, the real Fauntleroy listening to the story of the ideal uh, Fauntleroy. And uh, subsequently, Burnett's uh, retrospective uh, memoir and Birch's illustrations together served to create a very complex uh, system of mirrors. Uh, this artistic device uh, is called uh, mise en abim uh, or uh, text uh, in the text. And we see that uh, the book, uh, which in this illustration, uh, Burnett is uh, seen reading to her son, uh, is of course none other than the manuscript of little Lord Fauntleroy uh, itself. Uh, uh, so um, uh, here uh, we see uh, that um, uh, on one of the illustrations uh, for the novel, uh, uh, Cedric is sitting uh, in the same uh, pose uh, as uh, in the previous picture. Uh, so Birch wanted kind of remind uh, to everybody that the boy is now repeating the pose and gesture uh, already drawn in his uh, illustration. He is shown in the same position as Cedric and uh, the suit itself uh, and the way it uh, recurs in both works serve to heighten the effect of recognition. And uh, of course, here we see uh, how fashion functions as medium because uh, the readers uh, long familiar with the Fontler outfit uh, couldn't fail to uh, recognize the suit and uh, the character. So this illustration shows a boy seated in an armchair writing a letter and one of his legs is tucked under him and next to him sits uh, his dog and uh, uh, the dog was very important. Uh, it was another detail emphasizing uh, the likeness of the two images. And uh, a similar important detail is uh, the fur rug uh, beneath the armchair and photographers offering portraits of boys in uh, Fauntleroy suits would fre frequently make use of these objects and place their sitters in the same uh, position. So here you see uh, also this uh, fur rug and even the um, uh, posture uh, is similar here also, uh, the same uh, fur rug. So um, uh, uh, to finish, I would like to deal a little uh, on how Birch was uh, selecting uh, what episode to illustrate. For instance, uh, he took uh, one of the episodes, uh, Just Lean on Me, 
I'll walk very slowly. And uh, it became a well-known uh, quote. And uh, this illustration was so influential that uh, it was subsequently repeatedly reproduced uh, in uh, various genres. Uh, for instance, uh, it was repeated in another series of illustrations by uh, Brock. And uh, it also uh, features in satirical cartoons and uh, in uh, 1921 film uh, with Mary Pickford. Uh, so it became one of the key motives uh, representing uh, the entire novel. And uh, for instance, uh, in the political cartoon, uh, Little Ted, uh, uh, Fauntleroy from uh, 1907, uh, uh, we see uh, the main uh, uh, character. Uh, it's um, uh, Ted, uh, uh, that is uh, the president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, supporting uh, Uncle Sam. And uh, Uncle Sam has clearly damaged his right foot. Uh, the bandage on it is labeled uh, Wall Street. And uh, the readers, of course, were uh, likely to recognize the reference uh, due to the caption uh, from the novel, uh, Lean on me, uh, Grandpa. Uh, so this uh, uh, poster was very famous. And uh, President Roosevelt here appears in a Fontleroy outfit, uh, complete with uh, flowing uh, golden uh, uh, love locks. So we see how uh, book illustrations may play a key role in the process of cultural interpretation, considerably broadening its uh, area of influence and uh, expanding into uh, different uh, genres. So uh, thanks for your attention. And uh, uh, so uh, next we shall see <laughs> how the process of fashion interpretations uh, will uh, work further. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Kuteska. So I am stopping to share the screen. Okay, cool. So um, today, uh, my paper is organized around a series of photographs taken by the aspiring young French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss and possibly also his wife Dina in Sao Paulo between 1935 and 1937. These photographs were published for the first time 60 years later, towards the very end of Levi Strauss's life, in the book that you can see here, titled Saudades de Sao Paulo. For those of you unfamiliar with the Portuguese word saudades, it is employed to describe a feeling of melancholy, longing, or nostalgia. It is purportedly untranslatable and assumed in somewhat romanticized terms to be characteristic of a distinctly Portuguese or Brazilian temperament. It's interesting to consider how the word saudade might lend itself to fashion with its ceaseless process of quotation and reconstruction of the past in which nostalgia plays a vital role. It is in much the same way that Levi Strauss in 1996 cast his gaze back upon the travels made at the very start of his anthropological career, curating these photographs of Sao Paulo and its inhabitants into new narratives via the storytelling medium of the photo book. The photographs of Sao Paulo document a rapidly transforming cityscape. It is one that was founded on coffee wealth and a diverse immigrant population, and which was poised precariously between an agricultural past and a modern vision of the future. The frontispiece to the book depicts a map of central Sao Paulo, 
with numbers that painstakingly mark the locations and the angles at which the corresponding photographs were taken. As has been well documented, Claude and Dina Levi-Strauss traveled to Brazil in 1935 as part of a small cohort of young French academics invited to help establish the University of Sao Paulo. This transnational program of cultural exchange has to be contextualized within the French-Brazilian special relationship, which dates to the mid 16th century. France's failed attempt to colonize terrain in Latin America evolved into a pursuit of cultural hegemony in the region that found fertile breeding ground in Brazil, who imported French luxury fashions and consumer goods. We can see here an elegant Dina Levi Strauss sporting a knitted cardigan with puff sleeves, a knee length pencil skirt and a matching hat. The outfit it seems somewhat jarring with the rural Brazilian setting, which was presumably on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. She's captured with the French historian Fernand Brodel, the geographer Pierre Monbet, and the philosopher Jean Morgue. The men are dressed in an array of casual modern ensembles, presumably adapted for the so-called primitive Brazilian wilderness, while still, while still maintaining the streamlined tailoring of the civilized European city. These photographs reiterate the significance of fashion as a visual marker of modernity and one that traveled from France to Brazil and from the city to the countryside, enabling a sense of efficiency and discipline to be recreated on arrival. They are a potent reminder that a Eurocentric perspective in dress and outlook will invariably have coloured the Levi Strauss's perception of Brazil and Brazilians. Before we leaf through the pages of the photo book, however, it's useful to outline the perspective that I place onto these images. Much of my research examines fashion as a transnational form of modernity which operates across rather than within national borders. I'm interested in the inherently geographical nature of fashion, how it unfolds, evolves, and takes shape through the different pairs of hands it passes on its journey back and forth across the globe. Fashion is a lens, after all, through which we can unpack complex stories of local, regional, national, and international identities at their intersection with global networks of exchange and influence. As the Brazilian anthropologist Renato Ortiz articulates, if modernity refers, quote, to the technological progress of cities, to their organization and management, then it is also a discourse, a language through which Latin Americans become aware of these changes, unquote. Fashion is both a discourse and a social dynamic of style change. It involves a sense of novelty and renewal through which the now, otherwise known as modernity, is experienced and articulated. Yet whilst modernity in Eurocentric discourses has tended to be equated with a linear narrative of progress and development, photographs such as these enable us to engage with new interpretations of what it might mean to be modern in Sao Paulo during the 1930s. It enables us to consider how certain mindsets, which frequently advocated identities that were and European, intersected with questions of race and regionalism in the formation of national identity in Brazil. As Barbara Weinstein elucidates, the construction of a regional identity in Sao Paulo in the first half of the 20th century favored exceptionalism. It was an identity inseparable from the city's, quote, ever more spectacular economic success story, unquote, and defined in opposition to the northeastern part of Brazil, thus forging a direct correlation, quote, between whiteness and progress and blackness and backwardness, unquote. 
The 1930s certainly marked a period of intense industrialization and modernization as Sao Paulo rapidly transformed from a modest seat of coffee and agricultural production to Brazil's industrial and financial center. Levi Strauss's photographs provide unique insights into the construct into sorry the contradictions of a Brazilian modernity that operated within its own nexus of power poised between the old world and the new world, the past and the future, between whiteness and other races and ethnicities, whilst illuminating how different representational modes reconfigure our understanding of fashion. The young academic's camera captured, on the one hand, newly built avenues, neighborhoods, skyscrapers, and sharply dressed pedestrians, modern transportation networks, such as the urban trolley car that can be seen here, emerging patterns of consumption in the form of restaurants, cinemas, cafes, and shops. Yet on the other hand, Levi Strauss also documented cattle wandering through the streets, laundry drying on makeshift clotheslines hung in dirt courtyards in the shadows of modernist blocks as well as crumbling belle epoque facades and general urban detritus. Despite the clear influences of modernity and industrialization, Sao Paulo in 1935 was still, as Emmanuel Loyer emphasizes in her biography of Levi Strauss, quote, raucous, many-sided, and seemed as if it were unfinished, as attested to by the photos he took with his Leica camera, <clears throat> unquote. Levi Strauss's photographs are indeed textured images, a term that I use to acknowledge the amount of detail that can be extrapolated from a single image, as well as to hint at the tactile qualities of the photographic medium that are centered on the surface of the image. They stand out for their unfinished nature and the resulting surface variations that arise from technical deficiencies, including blur, light sleeks, badly exposed images. Levi Strauss, Levi Strauss spoke of his frustration with, quote, the physical and mechanical constraints of the camera, unquote, which provided the photographer with restricted options for emitting data from the outside world. All of these so-called problems add to the patina of the resulting images highlighting the very material nature of the photographic medium that to me has always felt so fitting to the representation of fashion. The graph on which I want to conclude. It first captured my attention in July, 2019 in the air conditioned photographic archive of the Instituto Moreira Sales on Avenida Paulista. <clears throat> Perhaps it is the directness of the protagonist's gaze, her clear sense of style and awareness of how to form a look, the technical inadequacies of the photographer, and the overall blurriness of the image, which frustrates the viewer's ability to fully read the fashions documented in exact detail. All of this invests the photograph with an immediacy an awareness in the viewer, perhaps, that this fleeting moment captured on film might act as a revelation of depth into the anonymous identities and sartorial histories of its very, of its very modern protagonists. The couple's clothing is adorned with modernist prints, the woman's striped dress and the man's checkered tie, which are offset by the linear architectural facade that dwarfs the right-hand side of the photograph. This symbiotic relationship is emphasized by other visual indicators of modernity, electricity cables crisscrossing the sky and powering the Belle Epoque street lighting, modern transportation, signs and billboards, and the seemingly infinite avenue that stretches towards the concrete framed Edificio Martinelli, the first skyscraper to be built in Latin America in 1929. That's the Edificio Martinelli that I've um, circled in pink. Um, directly in line with the Edificio Martinelli to the left of the image, a man in a black fedora 
and leather shoes moves away from the viewer's gaze. The creases and folds of his crumple, crumpled linen suit accentuated by the spare monochromatic palette. Photographed from behind, his dissonant mode of direction injects a sense of dynamism into this urban scene, resisting any notion of a linear pathway to modernity by exhibiting different speeds, modes of direction, and ways of inhabiting the modern city. Pedestrians of different ages and ethnicities stand stationary on the side of the pavement, reminding the viewer that Sao Paulo is a city in constant flux and traversed by individuals of various generational, social, racial, and economic backgrounds. Look even closer at this highly visualized representation of a modernizing Sao Paulo, however, and the photograph reveals an added layer of complexity. We begin to observe signs that this, quote, dream city run up for the cinema, unquote, as Levi Strauss referred to Sao Paulo, has been fractured by the very modern technology of the camera itself, which has been so indiscriminate in terms of what it has captured. There is an excess of the everyday, which leaks out of the photograph and disrupts its documentation of emerging social and metropolitan identities as seen in day-to-day -day lives on the street by capturing quite literally too much. We observe debris in the gutter and a smattering of oil fracturing the clean rational lines of the recently built avenues. Ghostly figures populate the background. In the very center of the photograph, uh, two young women in puff sleeve dresses can just about be glimpsed, standing aboard the motor car that speeds past. This myriad of contingent detail is something that the camera saw, but the photographer may not have spotted in the instance that the shutter was clicked. It is a detail that has risen to the grainy surface of the photograph later, waiting to be discovered by the inquisitive viewer. Christopher Pinney contends that the indexicality of the photographic medium always allows room for the possibility that something extraneous may enter into the camera lens. No matter how precautionary the photographer is, the camera necessarily includes, and it is, quote, precisely photography's inability to discriminate, its inability to exclude that makes it so textured and so fertile, unquote. Just as photographs leak out, documenting the unexpected or inadvertently providing the viewer with an overload of information, so too can fashion, as Rebecca Arnold notes, which often communicates something different to what the wearer had envisioned, perhaps unintentionally revealing too much of an inner personality, desire or anxiety. Fashion is, after all, a form of storytelling in much the same way that the researcher can use speculative. Sorry. Fashion is a form of storytelling, after all, in much the same way that the researcher can muse speculatively on the biographies and the narratives of the anonymous individuals who present themselves in dress, pose, and expression to the photographic gaze. Levi Strauss's photographs, with their capturing of the contingent, the unobserved, the unstaged, all those elements often removed from the formal world of high end fashion. A reminder that many different fashion systems operate throughout the world, just as multiple experiences of modernity are possible. Whether intentional or not, his vision of Sao Paulo facilitates our reimagining of fashion history in a new direction that is overlapping and multi-layered, much like the photographs themselves. Thank you. Oh, and back to Fran. Thank you so much, Liz. Brilliant, thank you. If we can have all our speakers back on camera and unmuted, that would be great. And then I'm going to pass over to Liv, who will be holding our Q&A session. Thank you to all our speakers for such wonderful presentations. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree that they were really, truly fantastic. Um, so we just have um, a short moment for a few questions. So I'll do my best to um, pick the best ones that I can. 
Um, so let's start by um, a question for Lisa. Um, one of our viewers says this project will, you've mentioned that this project will also include recording your voices. In what way um, do you envision doing this? I, I think what I, what I meant was um, that I'm working with, you know, the words of others. Um, I am interested in, in possibly recording these, but that's not what's happening right right, right now. What what I meant just then was um, was that, that I, was that I'm, and perhaps it's more easier to, to get a little bit. Uh, I tried to indicate with my voice and 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 so on, but it, it, maybe it's easier to see on the page. But that I'm I'm. I'm moving back and forth between the voices of the people I've spoken to and my own voice mm -hmm. constantly and that their experience, it's, you know, their experiences. But yes, I, I, um, it would be interesting to have this be a sound piece as well, potentially. A lot of our audience noted um, how beautiful your um, discussion was, especially how opportune, how opportune it was for um, World AIDS Day today. Um, one of our viewers um, has noted that your work feels incredibly multi-sensory with the element of storytelling, listening, discussing a person's history. Um, how have the physical barriers of COVID-19 and the current um, climate affected your work? I haven't been able, I mean, I was, I, <laughs> I, ha I should say that um, I really admired what, um, uh, Lisa, Lisa was talking about yesterday, and um, and I should say that uh, about f fashion curation and in this moment, and and I should say that a constraint is usually intensely generative for me, but I haven't yet completely figured out how to keep making this series given the requirements of social distancing. The writing takes place alone at home, but I conceived of the personal interaction as necessary and really part of the point. And I was really moved and amazed by what emerged and how things emerged. As um, as I spoke with the people who who met with me, and I started with people I know. And my plan was to move outward and 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 build this. And I still hope to to include more and more people um, who I don't are part of. You know, aren't my friends? I mean, friendship and d different kinds of intimacy are certainly part of the point of the project, also. And that's why. Um, I decided to read the piece that in, in which I sort of figure m much more. But um, I, I, anyone, if anyone has thoughts about that, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> outside, really outside, once it gets warmer, probably. You know. We have a question for Olga. Um, Olga, do you have any information about who is manufacturing or retailing the Little Lord Fauntleroy suits? Um, one of our audience would like to know. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh... Yes, uh, well, uh, I haven't got exact uh, information about uh, manufacturers. Uh, the picture I was showing uh, is uh, from uh, one of the American uh, catalogs of uh, ready to wear uh, kids' uh, clothes. And uh, besides uh, well, these uh, ready to wear, uh, suits, there was another option. Uh, such uh, kids' clothes could be made by uh, dressmakers, so they could be uh, individually uh, ordered. And also, well, uh, mothers, of course, they used to make uh, the clothes for their sons uh, themselves. Now, we have um, a question for Liz, um, both from Charles and Rebecca. Um, did Levi Strauss um, photograph anywhere else um, in the same way as San Paolo? Um, did he make any films about any other locations? Yeah, that, do you know, that's, um, that's a really good question. I, I don't believe he did because he became really well known for documenting, um, well, uh, you know, more anthropological subjects, more typical anthropological subjects. So indigenous peoples in various locations around the world. And I think that's what really drew my attention to these because at the very beginning of his career, he's just traveled from France. He's not even known as an anthropologist when he's taking these images. And in many ways, I think they're a bit like kind of travel shots as he's, you know, just arrived in Sao Paulo and he's documenting what he can see. And I think that's what kind of fascinated me about them. Cause I always think in many ways it's when 
we sort of reveal the most when we're not trying that hard. You know, when we something slips out, we say a word or, you know, or, you know, I think when when he thinks too much later, when he becomes more, you know, properly established as an anthropologist, maybe I find those images much less interesting. Um, so I don't know of any other cities he did, but, you know, it could be that's definitely something to look at. Sorry for my paper crunching as well. I didn't realize. <laughs> Um, we have another um, question for Lisa, um, just in the final few minutes. One of our viewers would like to know um, what drew you specifically to keeping the t-shirts in particular? Um, you speak of the fabric of the, um, the everyday and arguably there are a few more garments um, that class as everyday um, aside from the t-shirts. So what is it that drew, drew you to that garment in particular? It's an interesting question. It's a really smart question. I mean, it's certainly he wore he wore he well as you can see he he collected t-shirts and um, and he wore them, you know, with great sex appeal and um, swagger. I would say, um, you know, he he wore them. He was very tall. He wore t-shirts that were really cropped sometimes, and he wore t-shirts that were you know that, you know, quote, fit him. I, I, I think I was under um, duress also when I chose those things. And I think I was trying to imagine something characteristic. I was trying to imagine something that maybe I might wear because I had worn clothes, shirts of people I, I'd lost and coats and other things before, men's clothes and women's. And, um, but as it turns out, this was the first time that I, Took them out of my closet, and um, Stephen, um, you know, had given away the things that that had been gems. So I thought I will combine. You know, um, it actually makes sense in this case for me to bring the things that I had saved of gems and and have St Stephen try them on, and then he invited someone else to participate. And so it was a really interesting kind of concatenation of its own. Um, that was about you know, my friendship with Jim, our shared friendship, his, the way that he mentored these two younger filmmakers. Um, and it did, it was transformative, actually, you know, it did, it did end up making me, th making me think I should give these away. And that was partly because of what Stephen said. I, I think that part of what interests me about this, um, the sort of constraint that I've made up for this project is seeing how, thinking, you know, I know from my own experience that it has wearing clothes of people I've lost. It doesn't just have to do with the article of clothing, but how we transform it as we take it up or take it on and on what occasions, what, it, what it's like to hold so, something that belonged to someone we love on or against our body, to take that out into public, to have some people maybe know that and others not. But the dynamic, the sort of transformative dynamic became even clearer as I spoke to people I thought it was fascinating that Anne, for example, thought that she was talking to me about her mother's dresses, but she only remembered, um, you know, after we talked for about an hour about her father's bathrobe, that was such a big part of her life that she wore until it was in tatters and that he wore every single day. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> I think we'll just take one more um, final question. Um, this is also from Charles and it's for Liz. Um, Charles would like to know, um, how does stilling the instant invite a different mode um, of analysis? Um, yeah, no, um, thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Charles. Um, Charles is kind of, I think he's talking about this idea I was saying of this kind of excess of the everyday and photographs kind of leaking out more than we, uh, perhaps realize, you know, as photographer and maybe as viewer also, when we first look, we don't always notice everything. Um, yeah, and I think there's something that kind of has an interesting parallel between um, photography doing that and also clothing doing that. Um, how does stilling the instant, I, I don't know, that's something, I don't know quite, um, I don't know quite, I'm not sure quite, because I, I suppose in a way, should you look at images that have been taken very quickly, should we also look at them quickly? If I'm 
interested in how photographs leak out, then I would say something taken quickly, in many ways, we should spend even more time analyzing to see, you know, what it captured in the frame that maybe even the photographer didn't realize. But um, I think there's a lot of overlap um, between my work and Charles, and that's probably, we should have a chat. Yeah, soon. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, just one last question um, for Olga from Rebecca. Um, is there, um, were there any influences of Little Lord Fauntleroy dress on female clothing, um, so clothing for girls? Mm, uh, well, I wouldn't say there was um, uh, a direct influence on uh, women's fashion. It was, uh, uh, well, fashion for boys, obviously. Uh, but uh, there were some outstanding women who tried to uh, wear um, uh, Fauntleroy suit. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there is a famous uh, painting uh, by Leon Buxt. Uh, uh, that's uh, the portrait of the Russian poet uh, Zinaida Gipius, uh, the portrait of 1906. Uh, and uh, uh, Gipius is posing there uh, in uh, Fauntleroy suit. And uh, of course, uh, posing in such a tire for a woman at that time, uh, it was a flamboyant and uh, rebellious act. Uh, and uh, yet it uh, allowed Gippius uh, to achieve this uh, well desired subversive effect of uh, uh, detachment and um, uh, aristocratic uh, look. Uh, and also, uh, I think there was, well, uh, indirect uh, influence uh, of uh, this um, you know, fashion for uh, Fontlero look uh, because um, you know, parents, mothers, they were eager to uh, show their uh, social sta status and uh, mothers turned uh, to their children's dress uh, as a, a symbolic means of um, uh, self-expression and uh, mothers uh, use children's fashion to uh, demonstrate their social ambitions and uh, were actually competing with uh, each other to produce the biggest lace collars or, or uh, the most uh, elegantly designed uh, aristocratic uh, velvet suits uh, for their sons. So you know, there were such uh, uh, indirect uh, ways of uh, influence. Thanks for this question. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for such a brilliant session and thank you for joining us. And we're looking forward for the rest of the week. Thank you to all of our speakers. We've had such a wonderful evening. And goodbye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks for, to everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.